Hi, welcome to Close Listening. I'm your host, Zach Morgenstern, joined as always by silent co-host Ludwig von B. Uh, and I'm in a three-episode run where I'm talking about Stevie Wonder's classic period. So last time we talked about his excellent 1972 album, Talking Book, and now we're moving to 1973 and Inner Visions. This album won the Album of the Year Grammy, and he would win that for his next two albums. So three albums in a row, or three years out of four, he wins the Album of the Year Grammy. So that's a pretty impressive run. I, when I listened to these albums, I was disappointed, but you know, only in the sense that I expected to hear something amazing. Now, Stevie Wonder became a real auteur in this period. He wanted to do creative things, he experimented with keyboard sounds, and he moved between genres, I think really establishing himself as one of the pop artists who could even have some respect in the jazz community. The result is a sound that I don't always find makes a great personal anthem for marching down the street to, so it didn't necessarily become one of my favorite albums, but there's a lot of interesting stuff here to talk about. So let's get into it. The first track on this album is Too High, uh, and this is one of the jazzier ones, and it's one that I'd call more groove than melody, but unlike the Maybe Your Baby song on the last Wonder album that I sort of put down saying it was just pure groove and not, not enough of a song, this one has something a bit more going on. It's softer, it's kind of pleasant how his voice, his vocalizations just perfectly match the music. It sounds very smooth, very slick, and it has this weird 60s, 70s theme to it. It's almost like a slow jazz Lucy in the Sky with diamonds. She's a girl in a dream. She's a four-eyed cartoon monster on the TV screen. She takes another puff and says, it's a crazy scene. That red is green. She's a tangerine. I've heard this one interpreted as an anti-drug song. To me, if you look at the lyrics, it could just be Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds or whatever psychedelic number you want. So make of it what you will. The next track on the album is, I guess, the title track because it's called Visions. Uh, it's in a minor key and it uses a surprising amount of guitar sound for a Stevie Wonder song. And it really sounds like something Nina Simone would have sung. So to look at the lyrics a little bit, it says, The law was never passed, but somehow all men feel they're truly free at last. Have we really gone this far through space and time, or is this a vision in my mind? So one of the things people talk about with this period in Stevie Wonder's music is that he starts to get political, and he does, but he's always a bit cryptic in his political references, so he's someone you can like just if you're a liberal, but potentially you can see something more there if you're more than a liberal. So what I see in these lyrics is it sounds like a response to those who've said, okay, well, there was the civil rights movement and now everything's settled. Now, that feels like a real talking point of the 2000s. I don't know if in the 70s, you know, everyone had acted like racism ended with the end of the civil rights movement. It's harder to imagine, you know, people made that mistake back then because the civil rights movement had just happened and people could see what it had and accomplished. But I don't know, listening to it in the 2010 or 2020s, uh, that's what it sounds like to me. So the next song on the album, I suppose, is what you call its masterpiece. It's called Living for the City, and it's this long epic about uh, a boy who grows up poor in the country, but he has a loving family, and then he tries to make it in the city, but he can't uh, because he's put down by sort of general financial struggles and, of course, by racism. Uh, it has this cool keyboard riff. It has Stevie Wonder at one point putting on talking voices, uh, playing this racist cop. Uh, the one thing is because it has such a rough sound to it, it's not necessarily a sort of bop to it melody, but it's a very accessible and very poignant listening experience. After Living for the City, Stevie Wonder immediately switches tones to Golden Lady, which is just a simple, beautiful song. Uh, what The one thing I can say that's kind of interesting about it uh, is the chorus keeps using this line, I'd like to go there. And this refers to a verse where he says, there's something beautiful in this golden lady's eyes. So it seems like what C.V. Wonder is doing with his lyrics is he's taking the concept of metaphor and pushing it to their, and pushing it to his, pushing it to its limits. So he's, he's noticed that people will say, you know, love is a beautiful place and I want to go there with you. And he really wants to enjoy the fullness of this metaphor. He's like, if love is a beautiful place, I'd like to go there. I want to see this magical kingdom that is love. So that's the kind of cool thing that's going on in the lyrics of Golden Lady. Uh, after Golden Lady comes the real hit of the album. It's the more musical, more accessible version of Living for the City. It's called Higher Ground. 
Uh, so as protest songs go, uh, the lyrics are pretty vague. But what I like about it is it sounds like Stevie Wonder is embodying a character. Uh, if you look closely at the lyrics, it's like he's some fallen angel who's been re resurrected and is trying to turn his life around, trying to be a peace activist. And, you know, maybe you can't trust him because there's still that vibe of fallen angel to him. But, you know, the song is standing for the right thing. So here's what I mean uh, if you look at the chorus to the song, which sometimes I don't think stands out as much as the verse. I'm so damn glad he let me try it again. I guess he being God who brings back the fallen angel. Because my last time on earth, I lived a whole world of sin. I'm so glad that I know more than I knew then. Gonna keep on trying till I reach that higher ground. So the next song on the album is Jesus Children. Uh, so here's Stevie Wonder bringing in his Christian side. But it's a Christian side with a 60s twist because he name drops these other not necessarily Christian spiritual concepts. So he references Mother Mary, a supposed reference to the Beatles, and he also talks about transcendental meditation. Next on the album is a song called Love is Fair. You know, this is one of the lighter love songs on there. Uh, but there's something clever to the lyrics. There's a tiny bit of intertextuality, just, you know, there's that cliched saying, all's fair in love and war, and I looked it up. It's attributed to a 16th century playwright named John Lilly. Uh, and, you know, while this is mostly a, a lighter love song, uh, Stevie Wonder is pushing back a bit and saying, you know, even when talking about something as everyday and simple and pop song theme as love, we can still find a way to be philosophical. We can ask, is all fair in love and war? The next track is another hit. It's Don't You Worry About a Thing. And it's uh, not the most conventional hit, though I think it's still more commercial than Living for a City. And it's because Stevie Wonder opens with a character. Uh, and it's hard to know exactly what he's going for the, with the character, though it's some sort of fast-talking person, and he uses some Spanish and some English. And what you see again Stevie Wonder does with this song is just the tiniest bit of wordplay, but it's enough to be provocative. So thing is one of the least interesting words in the English language. It's what you put when you don't know what you're going to talk about it. And I usually hate when, you know, someone uses thing for a rhyme in a lyric because it means they didn't think of something better. But Stevie Wonder is paying close attention and saying, you know, thing is a word that has slightly different meanings. So he uses the phrase, everybody's got a thing. And then he says, don't you worry about a thing. So thing in those two cases, kind of the same word, kind of not. And he's saying, you all got your thing. You're all cool. You all got an idea. And then he just throws all those ideas away. But don't you worry about a thing, mama. And then the final track on the album is called Mr. Know-It-All. I don't think it quite counts as a hit, but it's a pretty accessible tune, uh, sort of in between relaxed and upbeat. And when I look it up, uh, there's a lot of speculation that it's about Richard Nixon. Uh, and Stevie Wonder would go on to write another protest song about Richard Nixon on his next album. That doesn't quite sit well with me because this song sounds like it's about a street trickster, a sort of wise talker who, you know, has the tricks to survive but is going to end up alone. I'm not sure I personally like that as a way of critiquing a Republican politician. Like, maybe it fits Donald Trump a bit better, to be honest. But for me, you know, R Richard Nixon, he's just an embodiment of the establishment. He's an embodiment of the elite. I think of a trickster as a figure who goes against the grain, whereas Richard Nixon was speaking the language of the American establishment. He was not tricking his way into power. He came from the annals of power already. But, you know, regardless of what you make of the song, it's a cool lyric. It's Stevie Wonder building a character. One final thing I wanted to talk about this, with this record is the artwork, which is by a man named Ephraim Wolf. Uh, I ended up looking up some of his paintings after this, and he did all kinds of illustrations, not just for Motown record covers, but for newspapers, for countercultural magazines, all kinds of things. And what I saw, I really liked. There was some really interesting use of color and three-dimensionality, which is what threw me off guard, because I don't exactly love this album art, uh, at least not the cover. If you look inside, uh, I think it gets a bit more interesting. Uh, I just like that there are these blue accents on the color, as well as, you know, these the, the various uh, people or characters who he draws on the inside. But this front cover, it's a little weird for me. I guess it's just a dusty, maybe a desert scene. But also, if you look closely, you'll see there's this laser coming out of the man's head, and I guess it represents Inner Visions, the title of the album, but you know, it's weird because it doesn't quite look three-dimensional, doesn't quite look 
two-dimensional. It's, it's just a little visually awkward. And my reaction to this is, well, the, the way I see it, that there are two kinds of album covers. There are album covers that are just a straight photo of the artist, sometimes meant to make them look glamorous or sophisticated or whatever, and those where the album cover is really part of the art of the album. So with a lot of the later Beatles records, you, you can't deny that the, the album artwork is part of the artistry of the album. Uh, and I think with both Talking Book, where you see Stevie Wonder uh, in this non-Western outfit looking down on the ground in front of this distinct background, or with Inner Visions, where you have this man with this laser hitting his head, it's clearly trying to be artistic cover art, trying to go with Stevie Wonder's overall auteurial approach. And if someone can find an interview where Stevie Wonder talks about this, I'd be fascinated, because Stevie Wonder, of course, could not see but because these albums were about him breaking free from Motown and really being a thorough artist doing all the work, I'd have to imagine he was really invested in what his records looked like. He didn't just want a sexy picture of him on the cover. Uh, and so the fact that this album, it's visually ambitious, it's done by a great artist, it has a lot going on, it's interesting, but it's still not quite pleasant to the eye. I just wonder if that speaks at all to Stevie Wonder's perspective. It's like, what would a great visual be but it's coming from someone who literally can't see, so it's not going to quite look like what a great visual would look like to someone who can. I don't know, that's only speculation. It's it's sort of hard to imagine Stevie Wonder giving Ephraim Wolf that instruction, and maybe I'm, I just happen to not like this cover art. Uh, but I don't like it, and I like it, and it's part of the experience of Inner Visions. So anyway, that's my whole take on Inner Visions. Uh, check out a video coming soon where I talk about songs in the key of life, uh, and Keep listening to Stevie Wonder and other great artists. See you next time.